This video program shows the components, functions, and the testing and adjustment procedures for the Cagetronic. What actually is the Cagetronic? K stands for continuous. Getronic is the description given by Mrs. Bosch to fuel injection systems. Let's first consider the parts which make up the Cagetronic and consider how they function. First, the fuel supply system. In order to show this more clearly, the pump assembly has been removed. It consists of a fuel pump, fuel pressure accumulator, and filter. The fuel pump draws the fuel from the tank through the fuel pipe and pumps it into the pressure accumulator. This pressure accumulator mutes the delivery pump noise and maintains a specific pressure in the system after the ignition has been switched off. This inhibits the formation of vapor bubbles and facilitates trouble-free hot starting. Fuel is directed from the pressure accumulator to the fuel filter. From there, the fuel is directed to the fuel distributor in the mixture control unit. This video program shows the components, functions, and the testing and adjustment procedures for the Cagetronic. What actually is the Cagetronic? K stands for continuous. Getronic is the description given by Mrs. Bosch to fuel injection systems. First, the fuel supply system. In order to show this more clearly, the pump assembly has been removed. It consists of a fuel pump, fuel pressure accumulator, and filter. The fuel pump draws the fuel from the tank through the fuel pipe and pumps it into the pressure accumulator. This pressure accumulator mutes the delivery pump noise and maintains a specific pressure in the system after the ignition has been switched off. This inhibits the formation of vapor bubbles and facilitates trouble-free hot starting. Fuel is directed from the pressure accumulator to the fuel filter. From there, the fuel is directed to the fuel distributor in the mixture control unit. At the mixture control unit, we differentiate between the airflow sensor and the fuel distributor. Working in conjunction with the airflow sensor, the fuel distributor has the task of providing a correctly measured amount of fuel relative to the inducted volume of air and of distributing this amongst the individual cylinders. The fuel distributor consists of the following parts, the upper and lower housing sections, the steel membrane, which simultaneously separates and seals the two housing sections, the metering slit barrel with control plunger, the differential pressure valves, the primary pressure control and non-return valve. The airflow sensor measures the volume of air drawn by the engine. It consists of an air funnel, 
and the sensor plate which connects via a fulcrum to the control plunger of the fuel distributor. Now for the function. First of all, the lower section of the fuel distributor is filled with fuel. A primary pressure control valve fitted into the lower section controls the pressure. When the engine is started, the sensor plate in the airflow sensor lifts relative to the engine's air requirement pushing the control plunger of the fuel distributor upwards. The control edge of the control plunger opens a section of the metering slits according to the amount of travel of the sensor plate. Fuel can now flow from the lower section of the fuel distributor via the control plunger to the upper section and from here to the injection valves. The primary pressure provides the injection valve opening pressure, allowing for finely atomized fuel to be sprayed towards the intake valves. At the mixture control unit, we differentiate between the airflow sensor and the fuel distributor. The fuel distributor has the task of providing a correctly measured amount of fuel relative to the inducted volume of air and of distributing this amongst the individual cylinders. The fuel distributor consists of the following parts, the upper and lower housing sections, the steel membrane which simultaneously separates and seals the two housing sections, the metering slit barrel with control plunger, the differential pressure valves, the primary pressure control and non-return valve. The airflow sensor measures the volume of air drawn by the engine. It consists of an air funnel and the sensor plate which connects via a fulcrum to the control plunger of the fuel distributor. Now for the function. First of all, the lower section of the fuel distributor is filled with fuel. A primary pressure control valve fitted into the lower section controls the pressure. When the engine is started, the sensor plate in the airflow sensor lifts relative to the engine's air requirement, pushing the control plunger of the fuel distributor upwards. The control edge of the control plunger opens a section of the metering slits according to the amount of travel of the sensor plate. Fuel can now flow from the lower section of the fuel distributor via the control plunger to the upper section and from here to the injection valves. The primary pressure provides the injection valve opening pressure allowing for finely atomized fuel to be sprayed towards the intake valves.
The differential pressure valves maintain a constant pressure difference. That is to say that the pressure in the lower section of the housing is 0.1 bar higher than that in the upper section. Thus it is only the metering slit section and not the tolerance and the primary pressure or the injection valve opening pressure which determines the fuel quantity. In order to adapt the mixture composition to the varying engine running conditions, there are a few adjustments to be considered. With the Cajotronic, we differentiate between the two pressure circuits. The delivery, or primary pressure, and the control pressure. The primary pressure is provided by the electric fuel pump and controlled by the primary pressure control valve in the fuel distributor. The fuel for the control pressure circuit is tapped from the primary pressure circuit. The actual pressure is determined by the warm-up regulator. The control pressure formed above the control plunger constitutes the opposing force to the air pressure acting on the sensor plate which in relation to its, the sensor plate's position, determines the actual composition of the mixture. The differential pressure valves maintain a constant pressure difference. That is to say that the pressure in the lower section of the housing is 0.1 bar higher than that in the upper section. Thus it is only the metering slit section and not the tolerance and the primary pressure or the injection valve opening pressure which determines the fuel quantity. The primary pressure is provided by the electric fuel pump and controlled by the primary pressure control valve in the fuel distributor. The fuel for the control pressure circuit is tapped from the primary pressure circuit. The actual pressure is determined by the warm-up regulator. The control pressure formed above the control plunger constitutes the opposing force to the air pressure acting on the sensor plate, which, in relation to its, the sensor plate's position, determines the actual composition of the mixture. The warm-up regulator. Its job is to adapt the composition of the mixture according to the engine temperature and load. How is this achieved? When the engine is cold, a bimetal strip causes a lowering of the control pressure. In this way, it's possible with the same quantity of air for the sensor plate and control plunger to travel upwards further, allowing more fuel to flow through a consequently greater open section of the metering barrel slits to the injection valves. When the engine is warm, the bimetal strip function is inoperative. The control pressure is thus increased. A higher control pressure means less fuel. Quite independently of these temperature-related factors, the respective control pressure is additionally corrected through the vacuum pressure in the suction pipe via a membrane in the warm-up regulator. This means that high vacuum in the intake system results in higher control pressure, i.e., less fuel. Lower vacuum produces lower control pressure, i.e. more fuel flow. Dependent upon installation position, the warm-up regulator is mounted upon a heat retainer. This prevents the bimetal strip from cooling too quickly after the engine has been switched off. Now the auxiliary air device. It allows more air to be drawn in by the engine in the cold state bypassing the throttle valve. In this way, the friction losses, which are greater when the engine is cold, are compensated for. Idle speed is increased. 
there are two models of auxiliary air device available. One which is electrically and the other coolant controlled. Now for the cold start facility. This is a starting aid for cold conditions. It consists of the thermo time switch, the zero degree switch, the cold start relay, and the cold start valve. When the engine is started, dependent upon actual temperature, additional fuel is sprayed by the cold start valve into the intake manifold. The duration of this additional fuel injection is dependent upon the setting of the thermo time switch and the duration of starter motor engagement. At a temperature of minus 20 degrees centigrade, the thermo time switch supplies the cold start relay with earth for a period of 12 seconds. At a temperature of 35 degrees centigrade and above, there's no additional injection. To improve cold starting, a zero degree centigrade switch has been incorporated into the cold start facility. This has the effect of holding the cold start relay operative at temperatures below zero degrees centigrade. Thus, the duration of the additional injection is dependent solely upon the function of the thermo time switch. Those were the various parts and their functions. Let's look at them again in sequence. We've been discussing the fuel pump, the fuel accumulator, the fuel filter, the mixture control unit, which consists of the airflow sensor, and the fuel distributor. The primary pressure regulating valve, the warm-up regulator, the auxiliary air device, and the cold start facility, which consists of the thermo time switch, the cold start relay, the cold start valve, and the zero degree switch. Now for test and inspection procedures. Before starting work on the cage tonic, make absolutely sure that the engine is running well. Ignition and valves must be properly set, and the spark plugs must be functioning effectively. Exactly how the work is carried out on the system will now be demonstrated by our technician. Let's start with the fuel system. First, a visual inspection. We check all hoses and supply line connections for seal. Then we check the fuel flow quantity. We want to know if enough fuel is being supplied to the mixture control unit. The tools required for this task are this petrol pipe and a measuring container of about two litres capacity. The pipe is attached to the return line of the fuel distributor. In order to bring the fuel pump into operation when switching on the ignition, detach the fuel pump relay and bridge terminal 15 to terminal 87 at the relay socket. Caution. If terminal 15 is mistakenly bridged to terminal 31B, the control unit of the ignition circuit will be shorted out. The electrical connections to the warm-up regulator and the thermo time switch are also detached. Should the engine have an electrically controlled auxiliary air device, this connection here is removed as well to prevent the heating elements from warming up unchecked. Switch on the ignition now for a period of 30 seconds. 
a minimum of 750 cc of fuel must now be in the container. If there is less than 750 cc of fuel in the container, the reasons for this could be the following. The fine filter in the tank unit is clogged. The fuel feed pipe has a kink. The fuel pump has a faulty electrical contact or is worn. The fuel filter is clogged. If it is to be exchanged, Note the fitting instructions on the filter housing. Now checking pressure. We check both the primary pressure and the control pressure. The primary pressure is provided by the electric fuel pump and controlled by the primary pressure control valve in the fuel distributor. The fuel for the control pressure circuit is tapped from the primary pressure circuit. The actual pressure is determined by the warm-up regulator. The control pressure formed above the control plunger constitutes the opposing force to the air pressure acting on the sensor plate which in relation to its, the sensor plate's position, determines the actual composition of the mixture. To check the primary pressure, we unscrew the pressure pipe leading from the fuel distributor to the warm-up regulator. The tools required are this, and this testing connection. and the 10 bar pressure sensor. One end is screwed to the fuel distributor. The other to the control pressure pipe of the warm-up regulator. We clamp off the pipe to the warm-up regulator and switch on the ignition. The tester should show a primary pressure value of between 4.5 to 5.2 bar. The tester should show a primary pressure value of between 4.5 to 5.2 bar. Should the primary pressure reading not be between these limits, it can be adjusted up or down by adding to or removing these washers in the primary pressure valve. The actual control pressure valve is dependent upon temperature. We therefore measure the temperature of the warm-up regulator. We do this using the service tester temperature probe. Now we can test. We open the clamp and switch on the ignition. The pressure indicated must correspond to the value as shown in the table for the temperature as just measured at the warm-up regulator. If the control pressure is not within the given tolerance, it could be due to the following. If the control pressure is not within the given tolerance, it could be due to the following. The return pipe is kinked or incorrectly rooted. The non-return valve in the fuel distributor could be defective. Or the warm-up regulator is defective. We remove the return pipe from the warm-up regulator at the fuel distributor, plug the opening and again test the pressure.
If the pressure reading is still outside the tolerance limits, then the warm-up regulator is defective and must be exchanged. If it is not defective, we check the non-return valve in the fuel distributor, then the return pipe for blockage. The auxiliary air device check. We uh, differentiate here between the coolant controlled and the electrically controlled auxiliary air device. In order to check the openings, we remove the auxiliary air device. In the electrical version, the air bore is approximately half open when the engine is cold, i.e. at about 20 degrees centigrade. The coolant controlled auxiliary air device must show a gap of 5.5 millimeters at 20 degrees centigrade. Setting corrections can be made via the adjusting screw of the expansion element. After remounting the unit, the pipes are reconnected and the engine started. When the engine is cold, then if the air supply is interrupted by clamping the hose off, the engine revolutions must drop. Should the engine be warm, then there should hardly be a noticeable difference when the hose is clamped off. If this is not the case, then either the hose is leaking, the auxiliary air device defective, or the electrical supply faulty. Now to inspect the mixture control unit. In order to check that the sensor plate is correctly positioned, we've removed the air intake dome at the airflow sensor. Correctly positioned, the upper edge of the sensor plate is flush with the base of the air funnel. It must not be seated higher than the funnel base or maximum 0.5 millimeters below. The zero position can, if required, be adjusted by bending this leaf spring. After checking the sensor plate positioning, we check the airflow sensor fulcrum for ease of travel. Switch the ignition on for about five seconds. After switching off, a residual pressure will have been maintained, causing the control plunger to come to rest on the fulcrum. If the sensor plate is now moved upwards, an even resistance must be felt during the whole length of travel. If the sensor plate is then allowed to fall back downwards again, it should show a spring-like return to the zero position. Let's pull the sensor plate upwards again, then return it slowly to the zero position. One should be able to feel the constant contact of the control plunger. If the fulcrum movement becomes impaired, the airflow sensor must be exchanged. If control plunger movement is impaired, the fuel distributor must be exchanged. To test control pressure of a warm running engine, Remove the vacuum pipe from the warm-up regulator and plug it. The test value must be between 2.7 and 3.1 bar. When the vacuum hose is reconnected, the controlled pressure must be between 3.4 and 3.8 bar. Should the pressure readings under the respective conditions not be within the given tolerances, despite trouble-free return flow, then the warm-up regulator is defective. Checking for seal is the last test of this system as a whole. To do this, we switch the warm engine off. After a standing period of 20 minutes, the residual pressure in the system should register a minimum of 1.5 bar. Should this not be the case, then 
the non-return valve of the fuel pump, the pressure accumulator membrane, the non-return valve in the fuel distributor, the cold start, and the injection valves must all be checked for seal. If faults on the running engine can be traced to separate cylinders, and if the timing is known to be correctly adjusted, spark plugs are not faulty, compression values are good, and the air intake system is tight, then the following could be the cause of the fault. Either the injection valve or the injection line of the respective cylinder is defective, or the fuel distributor could be malfunctioning. In which of these two components the fault is to be found can now be established with the following simple test. We change over the injection line of the faulty cylinder at the fuel distributor. If the fault can now be diagnosed at another cylinder, then the fuel distributor is faulty. If the fault is still to be found on the same cylinder, it's either in the injector valve or the injector line. Next, let's take a look at the cold start device. We check the cold start valve with this test lead and proceed as follows. Remove the wiring harness plug from the cold start valve, then remove the valve. The fuel line stays connected. Now connect the test lead to the cold start valve and hold it over a measuring beaker. If we now tap the battery terminal with the test lead clips, the start valve will spray. If, after drying the valve off, no fuel drips off it within one minute, then the valve seal is tight. Now we know that the cold start valve is in working order, but the starting facility is still not functioning. The following could be the cause of the fault. The diode relay including the cable connection or the thermo time switch could be defective. Let us first of all examine the diode relay. We remove the breech contact in the relay socket and then refit the pump relay. We connect the test line only to the wiring harness plug. If we now remove the plug on the thermo time switch and apply terminal W to earth, we will have simulated a closed thermo time switch circuit. On starting the engine, a minimum current of 9 volts must exist between the two terminals of the test lead. If this is not the case, then either the leads to the cold start relay are broken or the relay itself is defective. Next, we check that the thermo time switch is functioning correctly. We check the thermo time switch by measuring its electrical resistance. The required test values will vary depending on the type of switch. For the thermo time switch in question, the following are the required values. Terminal G2 housing, temperature above 40 degrees centigrade, resistance 100 to 200 ohms. Terminal W2 housing, temperature above 40 degrees centigrade, resistance 100 to 300 ohms. Terminal G2 clip W, temperature less than 30 degrees centigrade, Resistance 35 to 55 ohms. Terminal G to clip W. Temperature above 40 degrees centigrade. Resistance 50 to 80 ohms. 
Let's look at an example. Resistance terminal G to terminal W at a temperature of less than 30 degrees centigrade is 49 ohms. The test value is within the limits as shown in the table. The required test values for other thermotime switches can also be taken from the technical data provided. If the cold start facility includes a zero degree switch, the task of the zero degree switch at temperatures below zero is to make the diode relay hold the on position. Let us simulate this condition by connecting up the two zero degree connections holding the terminal W of the thermotime switch to earth and start up the engine. The cold start valve must continue to spray even if the starter motor is no longer engaged, provided that the ignition is still switched on until the terminal W is removed from earth. After removing, we check it by cooling it with a cold spray to below zero degrees centigrade. We then measure the electrical resistance. Below zero, its circuit must conduct, but above zero, its circuit must be broken. After carrying out all of these procedures, any faults in the fuel supply system should have been corrected. Causes of an incorrectly running engine, although the fuel supply is intact, could be leakages in the air intake system, faulty adjustment of the idle speed and carbon monoxide content. We therefore check the complete air intake system between the mixture control unit and engine. Leakage should be found at the hose connection of the throttle valve housing, the bellows at the airflow sensor, the hose between the power brake unit and the air collector, the hose connection of the auxiliary air device, the suction pipes mounting, the injector valve seals, and the cold start valve flange gasket. We must also check for correct seal at the engine breather, the rocker cover gasket, the oil filler neck seal, the rubber gasket at the dipstick. After completion of these inspection procedures, a few remarks about adjustments. We adjust the idle speed, carbon monoxide content. To adjust the idle speed, all the vehicle's electrical equipment should be switched off. To make sure that the vehicle is operating temperature, i.e. that the oil temperature is at least 60 degrees centigrade. Idle speed is adjusted solely at the idler screw situated here at the throttle veil housing. It should be 900 plus or minus 50 RPM. The carbon monoxide content must be 1.5 plus or minus 0.5% by volume. Corrections may be made here at the airflow sensor after removing the tamper seal. Make sure that the seal is replaced after making the adjustment. If the engine is fitted with a throttle valve lifter, there must be a gap of three millimeters between the throttle lever and the operating bolt when the adjuster is extended. A correction can be made here at the bolt of the adjuster. The spring length of the extended adjuster must be 23 millimetres.
A correction may be made here at the nut. Let us summarize the position. We have seen the components of the Cagetronic, noted their functions and carried out test and service procedures. Thank you, Mr. Huber. The fault finding chart and also the workshop manual deal with all the test and inspection procedures we've shown. If you find that during repair work a fault can clearly be diagnosed, then you need only carry out those test procedures directly relating to it. Should you want any points explained again, just take another look at the cassette. First, the fuel supply system. In order to show this more clearly, the pump assembly has been removed. It consists of a fuel pump, fuel pressure accumulator and filter. The fuel pump draws the fuel from the tank through the fuel pipe and pumps it into the pressure accumulator. This pressure accumulator mutes the delivery pump noise and maintains a specific pressure in the system after the ignition has been switched off. This inhibits the formation of vapour bubbles and facilitates trouble-free hot starting. Fuel is directed from the pressure accumulator to the fuel filter. From there, the fuel is directed to the fuel distributor in the mixture control unit. Exactly how the work is carried out on the system will now be demonstrated by our technician. Let's start with the fuel system. First, a visual inspection. We check all hoses and supply line connections for seal. Then we check the fuel flow quantity. We want to know if enough fuel is being supplied to the mixture control unit. The tools required for this task are this petrol pipe and a measuring container of about two litres capacity. The pipe is attached to the return line of the fuel distributor. In order to bring the fuel pump into operation when switching on the ignition, detach the fuel pump relay and bridge terminal 15 to terminal 87 at the relay socket. Caution. If terminal 15 is mistakenly bridged to terminal 31B, the control unit of the ignition circuit will be shorted out. The electrical connections to the warm-up regulator and the thermo time switch are also detached. Should the engine have an electrically controlled auxiliary air device, this connection here is removed as well to prevent the heating elements from warming up unchecked. Switch on the ignition now for a period of 30 seconds. A minimum of 750 cc of fuel must now be in the container. If there is less than 750 cc of fuel in the container, the reasons for this could be the following. The fine filter in the tank unit is clogged. The fuel feed pipe has a kink. The fuel pump has a faulty electrical contact or is worn. The fuel filter is clogged. If it is to be exchanged, Note the fitting instructions on the filter housing. Now checking pressure. We check both the primary pressure and the control pressure.
to check the primary pressure, we unscrew the pressure pipe leading from the fuel distributor to the warm-up regulator. The tools required are this, and this testing connection. and the 10 bar pressure sensor. One end is screwed to the fuel distributor. The other to the control pressure pipe of the warm up regulator. We clamp off the pipe to the warm up regulator and switch on the ignition. The tester should show a primary pressure value of between 4.5 to 5.2 bar. Should the primary pressure reading not be between these limits, it can be adjusted up or down by adding to or removing these washers in the primary pressure valve. The actual control pressure valve is dependent upon temperature. We therefore measure the temperature of the warm-up regulator. We do this using the service tester temperature probe. Now we can test. We open the clamp and switch on the ignition. The pressure indicated must correspond to the value as shown in the table for the temperature as just measured at the warm-up regulator. If the control pressure is not within the given tolerance, it could be due to the following. The return pipe is kinked or incorrectly rooted. The non-return valve in the fuel distributor could be defective. or the warm-up regulator is defective. We remove the return pipe from the warm-up regulator at the fuel distributor, plug the opening and again test the pressure. If the pressure reading is still outside the tolerance limits, then the warm-up regulator is defective and must be exchanged. If it is not defective, we check the non-return valve in the fuel distributor, then the return pipe for blockage. Next, let's take a look at the cold start device. We check the cold start valve with this test lead and proceed as follows. Remove the wiring harness plug from the cold start valve, then remove the valve. The fuel line stays connected. Now connect the test lead to the cold start valve and hold it over a measuring beaker. If we now tap the battery terminal with the test lead clips, the start valve will spray. If, after drying the valve off, no fuel drips off it within one minute, then the valve seal is tight. Now we know that the cold start valve is in working order, but the starting facility is still not functioning. The following could be the cause of the fault. The diode relay, including the cable connection, or the thermo time switch could be defective. Let us first of all examine the diode relay. We remove the breech contact in the relay socket and then refit the pump relay. We connect the test line only to the wiring harness plug. If we now remove the plug on the thermo time switch and apply terminal W to earth, we will have simulated a closed thermo time switch circuit. On starting the engine, 
a minimum current of 9 volts must exist between the two terminals of the test lead. If this is not the case, then either the leads to the cold start relay are broken or the relay itself is defective. Next, we check that the thermo time switch is functioning correctly. We check the thermo time switch by measuring its electrical resistance. The required test values will vary depending on the type of switch. For the thermo time switch in question, the following are the required values. Terminal G2 housing, temperature above 40 degrees centigrade, resistance 100 to 200 ohms. Terminal W2 housing, temperature above 40 degrees centigrade, resistance 100 to 300 ohms. Terminal G to clip W, temperature less than 30 degrees centigrade, resistance 35 to 55 ohms. Terminal G to clip W, temperature above 40 degrees centigrade, resistance 50 to 80 ohms. Let's look at an example. Resistance terminal G to terminal W at a temperature of less than 30 degrees centigrade is 49 ohms. The test value is within the limits as shown in the table. The required test values for other thermo time switches can also be taken from the technical data provided. If the cold start facility includes a zero degree switch, the task of the zero degree switch at temperatures below zero is to make the diode relay hold the on position. Let us simulate this condition by connecting up the two zero degree connections holding the terminal W of the thermo time switch to earth and start up the engine. The cold start valve must continue to spray even if the starter motor is no longer engaged provided that the ignition is still switched on until the terminal W is removed from earth. After removing we check it by cooling it with a cold spray to below zero degrees centigrade. We then measure the electrical resistance. Below zero, it's...